So it's my pleasure to welcome Sarah Bergbreiter. A round of applause for Sarah. <laughs> So Sarah is, will be our, delivering our first Moonshot presentation about uh, micro-robotics. She is an associate, uh, an associate professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Maryland. And she actually presented at our SolferX event a year ago, and today will be uh, presenting her progress. So she's won so many awards, the DARPA Young Faculty Award um, for her work in micro-robotics, and also the NTF Award for the early demonstrations of jumping micro-robotics. So thank you all for uh, being here today. So this is the bridge collapse of the I-35 in Minneapolis that many of you might remember from 2007. Um, over 150 casualties, uh, over 13, peop 13 people dead. Um, there were over 140,000 cars per day that went over this bridge. It took about a year to be rebuilt, so enormous economic impacts. So right now, Obviously, this happens a lot more in the developing world than in the U.S. as well. So right now, the solution to that is something like this. So it's basically some guys hanging under a bridge, trying to cram their necks into very confined spaces, trying to find problems before they happen. And honestly, we're lucky if this happens you know, once a decade or so, if at all, in the developing world. Another thing that we see far too much of on TV are disaster scenarios like this. So this was the Christchurch earthquake in New Zealand in 2011. These enormous piles of rubble that these first responders are sifting through in order to find the lucky survivors as soon as the incident happens. And we'd obviously like to see more scenes like this where a four-month-old was rescued after the Japanese tsunami. So how do we solve these very disparate problems like monitoring civil infrastructure for failure, um, searching through rubble after an earthquake. Well, I'm going to propose this guy, right? So it's an ant. You're all familiar with it. Actually, what I'm going to propose is this, a robotic version of that ant. And this is a robotic version of the ant that we're working on in my lab at the University of Maryland. Um, these ants obviously are capable of some pretty impressive things. We have these amazing biological existence proofs of what these insects can do, right? You've all seen this at some point in your life. Right? Ants can actually build bridges out of themselves for other ants to cross over. They build rafts of themselves in the Amazon. Um, termites can build these amazing mounds up to eight meters high, effectively well-ventilated apartment buildings for other termites. Um, obviously, insects at this size scale are capable of climbing through the rubble that you saw earlier to find survivors. And also, insects at this size scale make themselves a very comfortable home on the civil infrastructure that we were talking about that's actually a relatively complex environment. So they're able to be able to be comfortable in, in these very complex environments and able to get around these environments. So these are some pretty amazing things, but how do we engineer the capabilities of this ant, or perhaps more importantly, a group of these ants, into our robots? Well. There's a lot of problems here. Um, first of all is mobility. So how do we locomote if we're very, very small in size? How do we define, how do we design the mechanisms and the motors in order to support those locomotion tasks? And how do we integrate the power control and things like sensing on board in order to get the kind of behavior that we want in a semi sort of kind of vaguely intelligent ant? And obviously, group behavior is a really important thing in order to be able to collectively uh, achieve some of the tasks that we've been talking about. And what do I mean by group behavior? Well, you've seen some of it already, but basically, this kind of, oops, you know, ants being able to transport enormous things by themselves. You've all seen ants carrying your potato chips or hot dog off the picnic table. Let's see. All right, so, so we're obviously working on all of these challenges in my lab. So I have students engaged in different parts of this project. But for time, I'm really going to focus on the mobility, the mechanisms, and the motors that are needed in order to make these kind of things happen. So I'll start with mobility. So this, you know, it's, it's not intended to gross you out, um, but this is a cockroach from Bob Full's lab at UC Berkeley climbing over some pretty incredibly rough terrain, right? If you or I were climbing over similarly sized terrain, we'd be slowly placing our foot in the proper location. But cockroaches are able to do this really fast without tipping over, in part because they have legs composed of both soft materials 
and rigid materials that allow them to damp out um, these vibrations for stability. So incredible locomotion. Um, another interesting way that insects are able to get around is through jumping. So in this case, insects are able to store a lot of energy in a spring, release that very quickly in order to get the high powers that they need to jump, even doing things like jumping out of water that you saw there. So one of the big contributions that my students and I have made is really this kind of combination of soft and rigid materials that make both of those locomotion abilities possible. So both the jumping and the the running over rough terrain. So in this case, we use microfabrication. So this is a typical silicon microfabrication. We can create very small features with this on the order of microns. Your hair is about 50 to 100 microns in diameter uh, for comparison. And we basically do this by a micromolding process. So we etch trenches into a silicon wafer. We refill that with a rubber material, um, like a silicone rubber. That's the blue part here. And then we clean everything off, uh, we make sure the rubber's cured, and we etch more trenches. And so we can define silicon features, we can define elastomeric features, all at very, very small size scales. But how does this help us make robots? Well, this is a little jumping mechanism that we designed in the lab. It's about four millimeters on a size. This video looks very freaky to anybody who's done microfabrication type stuff in the past because you're not used to seeing materials stretch this much. We've really been limited to rigid materials in the microfabrication workspace. So the way this works is that this little mechanism is going to be compressed, store energy in the springs, and then released for a jump. Right? There's no motors on this right now, no power supply. Right now this is actuated using a method in my lab that we call graduate student with tweezers because they have the time, right? All right, so you get some pretty incredible jumps out of this little four millimeter mechanism. So this is Aaron, the graduate student in question. And what you're seeing here are some pretty impressive jumps. These are almost 100 times the, the length scale of this little mechanism. You see it bouncing on the ground. It's robust. It survives all of these bounces in part because of those combined uses of materials until, of course, we eventually lose it because it's really tiny. So. We're also working on the motors. So we want to ultimately not use the graduate student with tweezers, but add motors on board this thing as well. So these are some electrostatic motors in the lab. One of the great things about using microfabrication is that we can use a lot of the ideas that people have already developed in silicon, like actuators and sensors, for our robots. So this particular motor has a power density greater than insect flight muscle and is pretty efficient. For us, pretty efficient is about 10% efficient. But it's still really hard to integrate all of this with the mechanisms that I showed you for locomotion. So right now what we're doing is we're cheating by using magnets to really study this locomotion problem. So in this case, what you see here, you've got the elastomer joint, the little rubber joint that I was pointing out there. There's an embedded permanent magnet in this that's being manipulated by an external magnetic field. It's a lot like you, know, you entertaining your five-year-old you know, cousin by like, running a magnet under the, uh, under the table. So this would eventually be part of a micro-robot leg in the robot that I showed you earlier. Right? In fact, this is part of that micro-robot leg. So this has magnets embedded in it. It has these elastomeric joints. This is a penny for scale, to give you some idea. One of the really interesting problems is that we have no idea of how to make something the size of an ant move. Right? It's a big problem a Roomba would you know, get caught up by these stairs, could get caught up by these, these uh, chairs in the room. Um, these robots, we really have no idea of how to make them move. We have a very good model for everything from a cockroach on up as to how it moves. We all move in this kind of bouncy locomotion as we're running along, like a mass on a spring. But as I'm really small, the interaction of my feet with the ground is going to affect my locomotion more than my mass and my inertia. So having physical models like this will really help us learn how we want to locomote. And so this guy does move, right? So there's an external magnet spinning around underneath that that's moving the legs and having this guy run along. We can have these at slightly larger scales we've shown moving at 10 body lengths per second as they, as they move along. So it's, it's, it's got a lot of potential, I think, in terms of helping us define how we want to locomote. And the really interesting thing is that once you have physical models at this scale, 
you can go back to the biologists that have inspired a lot of this in the first place, and they can learn a lot more about the ant in question, or the termite in question, or the spider in question. So there's really some interesting things that we can do with this. But ultimately, we want all of that sensing and control and integration and power on board the robot, right? We don't want to deal with these external magnetic fields. And not everything needs to be bio-inspired either. So this is a small robot that we've designed in the lab. So it's about four millimeters by four millimeters by seven millimeters in size, about 300 milligrams, about the size of a Tic Tac for reference. It has everything on board, even in its most rudimentary form. We have sensor, a little light sensor, we have a transistor for control, we have capacitors for power, and the actuator actually helps us with the power problem too, in that it's storing chemical energy. And we have what is effectively a little micro rocket robot with a microfabricated energetic material. We can create little pixels of this material and set them off independently for multiple jumps in our robot. So in this particular instance, we took one of those pixels and put it on the belly of this robot. And what we got out of it is about an eight centimeter jump for our 300 milligram robot. Um, there was no nozzling on the energetic material, so we can do a lot better than this even. And the incredible thing is that this is all done without wires, without tethers, and it's incredibly small. So this should give you some idea of how we can tackle some of the problems that I told you about earlier, of the civil infrastructure jumping and rolling through rubble after a, after a disaster. Um, but these things have a lot of other potential applications too, right? Even if you're not quite as small as the, as the submarine from the Fantastic Voyage, which is a 1960s movie, um, for those who haven't seen it, you can pretty radically change the way we do surgery or even the accessibility of surgical capabilities if you have something like these little robots. You, you have the sensors, the mechanisms, the actuators, all of these very small size scales, maybe we can make Luke's hand from Star Wars and much more capable prosthetic devices. Or you could completely change the way we do construction or solve the humanitarian problem that we have after natural disasters by having termites, robotic termites, build houses instead of destroy them. Right? So you could completely think that they radically change the way that we do that if you have these small little robots. So the challenge, I was supposed to come up with a challenge for you guys, the challenge that I have uh, for you today is there's, you know, obviously an enormous number of challenges to make all of these things happen. Um, but I tried to pick one that kind of aligns best with catalyzing innovation. And the challenge I have for you is how we make this kind of research and this playing around with these ideas for microrobotics accessible to more people. Right? Certainly I have some ideas, my students have some ideas, but it's absolutely imperative that we get more perspectives you know, focused on this problem. And right now, if you want to do research in this area, you really need a multi-million dollar clean room in order to do this. Right? This is the Intel inside, bunny suit, go in. It's incredibly expensive startup costs in order to think about these, these kind of problems. So what can we do if we have simpler things? Well, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there in the maker space, right? There's maker spaces and communities now. Schools have their own maker spaces. Um, 3D printing has gone, come an incredible way. We can't print the very smallest things that I was talking about, at least that, not that I know of yet. Um, but what kind of things can we do if we have this 3D printing capability available? Well, this is a, uh, you know, we can't print the smallest robot, but this is about a gram and a half. Um, about a centimeter and a half in size. That's a penny for scale again. It's this little robot is 3D printed, it has embedded magnets, and it's running over 3D printed terrain. Um, and so we can study the locomotion problem um, using this kind of uh, setup, even though it's not at the, the, the smallest scale that we want to look at. This is the same thing at very slow motion. So what this robot is doing, we were studying gait um, for locomotion in this particular challenge. This is basically doing a four-legged hopping that's called pronking, right? And this guy is kind of jumping over this terrain, basically, right? And based on how we orient the magnets, we can get different gates. It's really kind of a fun problem, but the entire thing 3D printed and magnetically controlled, things that really anybody could do at home.
We can also start thinking about these group behavior problems. These are the kilobots from Radhika Nagpal's lab at Harvard. Right? You have a thousand robots. What kind of interesting things can you do with them? Right? These kind of skitter around and don't move around very well. But if you had the true mobility of insects, right, how can we start playing around with group, group behavior ideas with hundreds or thousands of robots without needing the space of this auditorium to do that, right? or the cost of all of those robots to do that? So what kind of things can we think about in order to get more people engaged in solving these problems? So obviously we need new design tools. Maybe we need kind of a killer application for people to think of, kind of related to the, the, the prize talk that we heard earlier. You know, simple, inexpensive fabrication processes for making things at very small scales, group behavior. But really the challenge that I'm posing to all of you right now is how we get more people involved in thinking about how we make these little robots that could potentially solve a lot, a lot of problems. So thanks for your time.